Howdy folks, this is Jagos, and we're going to sit here and talk about identity politics, the marketing, what's going on in the gaming industry, and how all of this stuff is kind of interconnected. Because this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while now. I'm currently looking to make a longer video about this with a whole bunch of facts, figures, statistics, all that stuff. But I do need to get these comments and thoughts out because a lot of people are sitting here and fighting on race politics, gender politics, sexuality politics, and are not understanding how all of these things are interconnected, how they're woven into the tapestry of America and all the things and all the problems of society that sit here and divide people and divide everybody. That's conservatives, that's liberals, that's socialists, anarchists, all, everybody kind of sits here and falls into these kind of issues, but they don't really have the way or the language to explain it. When you're, we're talking about feminism, we have a certain brand or strand of feminism that has become prevalent. A corporate feminist model, or not even just that. It's also the SJWism that we're seeing where people are becoming useful idiots. They sit here and talk about patriarchy and privilege without really sitting here and understanding or defining what they're trying to do. When they sit here and they attack you because you are a quote unquote straight white male, it kind of sits here and sounds like cult-like behavior. But these are all kind of interconnected. Not just this, but say... A lot of people want to dismiss Black Lives Matter because they don't understand the black struggle ha that has been going on for the last 400 freaking years. They don't understand how women, various different women, got votes at different times in different places. They don't understand all of the problems that have been going on with the LGBT community that have been interconnected with women's rights issues that were going on not only in the 50s but in the 70s they sat here and got coordinated in book book you know book clubs which moved got into movements that sat here and worked to sit to give them rights and privileges and everything else uh when they were some of the most oppressed people for like say the 50s now look hoover j edgar hoover was a gay man he was a cross-dresser. He got called a faggot by Nixon when he died. There, I mean, he was a very powerful man, but he was also a gay bigot. This is, when, he, when you look at J. Edgar Hoover, he was a gay man that did not like black people. Especially with what he did to Martin Luther King, what he did to Puerto Ricans, what he did all over the place for various different people to sit here and accumulate power in his shadow presidency because he accumulated a lot of power until his death and even in death this guy's legacy has been one of the biggest ones but just because he is a gay man does not mean that he was like a very you know somebody that you want to follow all of this stuff gets into your identity and your identity as say a black person a white person a woman this all comes from your heritage but a lot of people don't really understand all of the ways that these types of things have been used to divide and conquer everybody for different reasons let's put this into pr perspective and put this into context when we had slavery the people that were at the bottom of the barrel that didn't get their rights that were part of the three-fifth compromise that usually happened to have darker skin the reason that they tried this and did it this way is because if you have the right phenotype you were less likely to be a slave for very long when we look at the history of slavery here in america the people that suffered the most that were brought over you know they weren't brought over on the mayflower they were brought over on slave ships they revolted against that because they didn't like being on slaves or working for somebody and working themselves to death. These are things that have been going on for 400 years, 500 years, 600 years since 1666 and the Glorious Revolution that deregulated the slave trade, gave people up to 
like 1700% profit to bring over a slave they didn't know from Africa, Ghana, all of these places, and then bring them over and sit here and have them shipped overseas that get, you know, get some insurance and these people shipped over and become slaves to a system that basically wanted to be the fuel for slave capitalism. I'm not going to get into everything, but this is one of the reasons that racism still exists. Because the people that revolted against this type of slavery usually happen to have the darker skin because they were the ones that were getting punished the most by all of these slave, I mean, not necessarily slave revolts. They started all these slave uprisings because guess what? They didn't have rights. They were loot. They were sitting here and told that this system was supposed to be just and, you know, justifiable and all this other stuff. But after working so long, so hard for somebody else, they didn't get much out of it. So slave revolts and uprisings constantly came about. This is, this is just racism. Now, after this was overthrown in 1864, there were other ways to sit here and have slavery. Convict leasing was a big one during the Reconstruction era. There was also Jim Crow. And it took international pressure to sit here and make these systems not work in the same way. Right now, we're sitting here and fighting with mass incarceration, where we have more people in jail than the rest of the country, than most of the country combined. Like Iran, China, Russia, they don't have as many people as America has in jail, impoverished, enslaved in some way, shape, or form. This is the racism that a lot of black people seem to face when you look at stop and frisk when you're looking at all of the things that they're sitting here and going through there is a reason that black lives matter or the watts rebellion or the la riots sit here and come about it's not because well there's black on black crime when you look at poverty when you look at the fact that people don't have jobs when you look at the fact that the system of capitalism that is in america does not work for these people what do you see? You see a lot of poverty. You see a lot of people fighting for scarce resources, artificially scarce, when we do have enough to sit here and go around all over the place. You don't need equity in everything. But people are sitting here and feeling like coloni colonies instead of like American citizens. That is the racism that we see. That's just one aspect. Let's go into the feminist aspect because a lot of people really don't know and understand what's going on with the feminist aspect and then we're going to get into that now here's the thing anita sarkeesian as far as i'm concerned is a neoliberal corporate feminist i say this with very strong disagreement with her i've already put in those out because what she does instead of sitting here and accepting any form of criticism She'd rather sit here and try to dismiss it as misogyny. That is identity politics. It distracts from the fact that what she's saying does not have bearing to the conversation at hand. She'd rather just sit here and play the victim and then sit here and continuously deride gamers, deride people for not knowing what the hell she's talking about. We've already done the videos on it. You can go back, look at those, where she says she admits that she doesn't know video games and she had to learn a lot about them. She put that out there herself. No one forced her to. Now, the journalists sat here, and I'll get into them later, but when we're talking about marketing, what Anita peddles in is that she sells fear so people can buy into the ignorance that she's... that. She's basically sitting here and marketing. That is exactly what this identity politics really does. What it does is it dismisses actual criticisms, arguments, and everything else to sit here and try to sidetrack with a straw man everything else that's going. Now, let's try to do one more example. We've done LGBT. We've done black, I mean, racism here in America. And then we've done feminism. Now, right now, we're having a whole bunch of things about white men. I want you all to understand where this idea of white men and white privilege actually comes from. As we've talked about with the black people, 
they had the wrong phenotype. They were born with the wrong phenotype. There's plenty of books that can sit here and tell you about slavery. They can tell you about reconstruction. Those did not go away. We've had at least two or three major migrations of black people. One from reconstruction era to like the 1950s where they moved northward. I'm not trying to get every last little detail right, but I'm just trying to give you the basic general overview through history. The South turned into a like white base which had right to work slaves white right to work states instead of slave states. This means that they have lower wages, it turned red, conservative, it turned very conservative to sit here and oppress the working class here in the South. In the North, they had higher wages. For the most part, black people got better off in places like Michigan and Detroit because you can sit here and see where Motown was created. Nowadays, since the 70s, when you look at the economics of it, the people that are hit the hardest, Native Americans and black people, that is one of those statistical facts that not a lot of people like to look into. It's not because there, there's a whole bunch of black on black crime. If you look at places that have a lot of poverty, you'll see a lot more crime. That, that's just a fact. It doesn't matter about skin color. If we look at other countries where poverty hits the most, such as Ireland, that's white on white crime. Not a lot of people are going to talk about it. It doesn't make sense. So let's stop using that little talking point. It makes no sense. What people are sitting here and looking into or forgetting about is the identity politics to sell you ignorance. That's exactly what it's supposed to be about. We can sit here and look at the racism issue and look at you look at Twitter or look at anything that's going on. But when you look at the racism issue, when you look at the feminism issue, it's not that these things are not relevant to the discussion. It's just that when you sit here and you have this upper class, middle class idea of what's going on and you don't know what the fuck is going on down with the other people with the lower middle grade people it's like you're talking a different language now i've sat here and i've tried to do my best in sitting here and giving you all a historical overview of what has been going on how does this how does this become relevant to the gaming industry in regards to anita sarkeesian it has to be understood she has been peddling in this identity politics for the last three years rather than sit here and talk about comment on the actual criticisms of her work she'd rather just sit here and say blah 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 misogyny and then dismiss anything that gives her a get out of jail free card because that is what her corporate feminist model kind of does right now you're seeing a lot of these similar criticisms when you look into what's going on with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton has a quote unquote fall feminism, a fake sort of feminism that's sitting here and dismissing people that are Bernie bros, quote unquote. You know, the people that won't vote for her that's sitting here and saying that all, only straight white males will vote for Bernie or something like that. Even though that strips out the women that are voting for him, the men that are voting for him, the minorities that are voting for him, everybody that is on message with what is going on with Bernie Sanders, they're being dismissed as a Bernie bro, quote unquote. That's a manufactured, a manufactured argument to sit here and dismiss what the man has to say. Because Hillary Clinton's own record is really, really terrible. For example, how many scandals do you know of where she sat here and targeted 900 conservatives? with the FBI in the 90s when she was first lady okay the email scandal has grown far larger than just a right-wing talking point it has been that she had an insecure server that we sit here and complain about what Edward Snowden did we complain about what Thomas Drake did we complain about all these people but it seems that the rules do not apply to a Hillary Clinton that is far bigger than just Benghazi. Now, in regards to Benghazi, you have to also remember there was Libya where she sat here and said on camera, we came, we saw, he died in regards to the overthrow 
of a democratically, I mean, he might be a dictator, but Gaddafi was a friend of the United States until he decided to nationalize oil, and then we said he has to go. Now, in regards to her supporting coups, she supported Honduras, she supported the coup in Haiti, especially after the, hurt, the earthquake, where they mismanaged $6 billion for the Haitians. Whereas she also sat here and opposed a minimum minimum wage hike from 34 cents to 61 cents an hour in Haiti. She sat here and had an Irish telecom that basically sat here and wreaked, you know, wreaked havoc on Haiti and sat here and gave more money to Irish billionaires than the Haitian people themselves. So when they have cholera and all this other diseases that are going through Haiti, that is something that you want to talk about, but you can't talk about it because I guess Hillary Clinton is a woman. These are what weaponized identity politics can do. And it's not just with conservatives. It's not just with SJW liberal cult feminists or anything like that. These are also things that also happen within religion. Like we've had for decades a fight between Catholics and Protestants here in the United States. JFK becoming the first Catholic was a major deal. That was due to identity politics. He was not supposed to be the first Catholic president. We've had a big deal about Obama being the first black president. We still have people that sit here and think that this guy is a, 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 a Marxist, Muslim, Christian liberal. How the hell do you think that all of these are the same thing with one person? This is how incredibly uninformed that, that identity politics can do to you. No matter if you're liberal or conservative. Because those are the main, main people that are currently using that. They get into this culture war narrative. Such as what Milo and Sargon do. Or, you know, the Ralph retort or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, no matter what you think about it, this is marketing really bad and irrational ideas. That's the exact point of identity politics. Distract you from the things that matter to you. Now, let me sit here. and I've gone over liberals. I have to also sit here and put this to a political context, not just with Hillary Clinton, but Donald Trump. He's doing the exact same thing right now in terms of identity politics. What is the biggest thing that he's been going on? It's about race. It's about the Mexicans. He wants to sit here and quote unquote build a wall. I want you all to think about what he's trying to distract from. The main thing that he's been distracting from is that he had a for-profit university. A for-profit university that sat here and scammed you that took taxpayers out of your paycheck. And those are the types of things that you cannot sit here and talk about with Donald Trump. Because if you do, he's going to sit here and attack you or the judge based on race. This is ridiculous. When he had that for-profit college, the thing about it was it was to sit here and take out, take away money from vets. It was to take away money from seniors. It was to take away money from poor people of all races, shapes, sizes, whatever. As long as he could get money, that's exactly the type of scam that he wanted to run. And he ran that as a scam. And if you, the more you look into it, the more you see that he is just as dishonest and just as crooked as Hillary Clinton. And I don't even want to get into all of the problems with Hillary Clinton. This is not supposed to be a political rant, but I'm just trying to sit here and show you. Conservatives, liberals, they use the same arguments. If we want to sit here and get into Stalin, I can do that as well. Because he used very similar types of deals for going after and assassinating Le uh, Leon Trotsky. But... That's another story for another time. This is not coming from just some crazy Frankfurt School cultural Marxist crap. That's nonsense. Because the fact of the matter is, nobody can sit here and connect the Chicago School of Cult Frankfurt School, or whatever the hell is going on, with what's going on right now. Because most of these people, Adorno, Foucault, and all these other people, usually tended to have very right-wing positions or about the culture wars that were going on in their time. And if you listen to them, they were criticized by feminists of the time and all these other people that were pretty much progressive. 
Now, a lot of people want to sit here and go back to the 1970s. They forget and ignore the 1990s. They forget about how many people were influenced by XYZ today. And they forget to look into different aspects of identity politics and the marketing that goes into it. So all of this stuff really, really sits here and forgets and ignores all of the major problems that we have. In terms of the gaming industry, what we forget is that we give a lot of power to publishers to sit here and control how they produce everything that they do. The developers do not have as much leeway as what the pub except what the publishers allow and give them. This means that you don't have a lot of power because you as a gamer and a consumer have to link up with other people or other devs to sit here and say, we're not going to sit here and support these games. Just think about another example. Capcom. When they sat here and took away our Mika's butt slap, everybody lost their damn minds. And the only thing that happened, the really the only thing that happened, was they sat here and said, well, we sat here and got a few emails about the butt slap and we decided to censor ourselves. And everybody sat here and filled in the blanks that it was an SJW and all this other stuff as if Capcom didn't have a reason to lie to you. This is the problem with identity politics. This is the problem when people don't really listen or try to think for themselves or, tr or aren't told about these things. Identity politics is a very dangerous thing because what it does is it dismisses the actual criticisms of publishers in the gaming industry, particularly Capcom, particularly EA. Because when EA sat here and when Mass Effect 3 came out, what was the thing that they did? Identity politics with Jennifer Hepler. And I'll link that one at the underbar. The thing is, when they sat here and said, well, you don't like what happened in Mass Effect or Dragon Age or all these other games, when you don't like what something happened, it's because she's a woman, all this other stuff. This is to distract you from the fact that they made a poor showing of their video games. Why are you still supporting them with that? Why do you still support these games? That's the kind of thing that people really have to sit here and really have to think about. What are they distracting from? That's how you sit here and defeat identity politics. You have to look at what these people try to avoid and then sit here and bring them back to that thing that they're trying to avoid. When Donald Trump sat here and tried to avoid the for-profit college issue, there were not many people that sat here and put him back on task and said, why do you support a for-profit college that sits here and hits your conservative base the most? Nobody sat here and said that, except maybe the nation. And I'll link that story in the on the bar as well. But the fact is, if you're going to sit here and look into things, look into it as identity politics. Look into what it does to discussions about race, gender, and everything else. Of course, this stuff is needed, but you have to sit here and you have to look into it and you have to really be able to sit here and talk about it before you can do anything else. And not a lot of people can really talk about this stuff as it needs to be discussed and as it needs to really get fleshed out. But I'm going to sit here and I'm going to leave it here. It's almost at 25 minutes, but the fact of the matter is I just wanted to give you all a general overview and my frustrations with this topic. I've been struggling with this topic and I'm still struggling because I do need a lot of videos to sit here and explain this thing so it makes a lot more sense and a lot of people can really come to grips and come to terms with the fact that identity politics has been with us for quite some time but people aren't really paying attention to it as they need to. But other than that, I'm going to keep it here and I'll see you all next time.